The way in which adaptations of Ghost in the Shell so far have carved out their own unique identity is really fascinating to me. Although they might all be quite similar at first glance, each has differing details and elements like tone or editing style. This is one of my favourite aspects of the franchise, the fact that you can switch so seamlessly from Oshii's blunt subtlety to Kamiyama's flashy excessiveness, all while staying in the world of Ghost in the Shell. But of course, this is less to do with what is being adapted, than more with how it's being adapted. As we've seen recently, it's not really a case of trying to replicate an already existing style or playing it safe. These practitioners have been very precise in their adaptations. I want to use this opportunity to look into how Ghost in the Shell has been adapted before and how it might be adapted in the future. The franchise begins with the Ghost in the Shell manga. Commonly overlooked in discussions about the franchise, Shiro created this back in 1989 after writing Appleseed, a similar cyberpunk series. The era in which the manga was created in is important to note as well, because it comes from an age far before the internet and doesn't really have a huge amount of technology to base its world on. And regardless, Shiro goes into immense detail with the intricacies of his world. In fact, the technologies and the workings of his universe become one of the most important parts of the story. His characters are also drastically different to most adaptations. Uh, Matoko, for example, is very tongue-in-cheek and very flashy with her appearance. And tonally, the manga is a lot lighter too, quite common for characters to jokingly bounce off each other during the series. In this aspect, it's not as tight as some of the other adaptations. One of the most important elements to take from Shiro's manga is the story structure. This is an element that never leaves the franchise and kind of makes it what it is. His manga chapters are always very tightly written, short stories that both start and finish in the same breath, but also play into the larger narrative of the world. And this is a really unique aspect of the series, and one that I don't think many writers can do. You get that sense of a large-scale world being developed in the story without having to sit through hours and hours of development. Shiro's chapters were excellently compact. The manga was a very unique addition to the wave of cyberpunk media in the 80s, and going into the 90s, fans were very hungry for more of the franchise, so much so that it became larger than the manga itself. Later on in the 90s, the first adaptation was created, Mamoru Oshii's film in 1995. Oshii wanted to use the manga as a base for his film, but wanted full control over where it went stylistically, and his approach was completely different to Shiro's original manga. What strikes you right away is that Oshii opted to use his photorealistic animation style instead of Shiro's more playful comic style which helped Oshii retain that sense of absolute detail in his story. Oshii's storytelling is very similar to Shiro's style, but it swayed more towards the philosophical side. Shiro's manga definitely had a larger focus on the workings of his technology. Oshii didn't push that aside completely, but his film is focused more so on the implications of that technology, rather than its technical operations. This was also one of the first digitally animated anime films. Oshii chose to embrace this when most productions were sticking with the more traditional methods. With this, he was able to capture that sense of realism that would become one of the movie's most important qualities. If I were to try and imagine the film using traditional animation and sticking to the manga's art style, there's a high chance it just wouldn't have aged as well. Character designs as well were one of the biggest changes from the manga. There were originally very bold cyberpunk designs that fitted well into the 80s, but Oshii employed a, a unique level of simplicity to his designs. Aspects like hair colour and clothing were all toned down to fit into Oshii's style, and this is quite a predictable choice looking at his work leading up to the adaptation. Ghost in the Shell almost picks up from where Pat Labor left off, and a lot of similar imagery is employed in both franchises. Despite the changes this movie makes, it's still very similar to the manga at its core. That style of compact, tight narrative is still present. It's not a hugely long movie, and it keeps its core narratives within that runtime. It starts and finishes a number of different storylines very smoothly, and that's something that's very true to the manga. Also, the level of depth in which it approaches its intricacies is another shared quality. Both the manga and the movie have impeccable precision in approaching their details. Whether it be the manga's technological descriptions or the movie's more philosophical dialogue, they both have a great consideration for detail. Oshii's movie had a massive reception all around the world, but he kept fans waiting almost a decade until his next instalment with Ghost in the Shell Innocence, or Ghost in the Shell 2. This was Oshii's follow-up to the original, and in my opinion, it's criminally overlooked. It rarely gets mentioned alongside the rest of the franchise, and I feel like it's being missed out completely by a lot of fans. Which is a shame, because it's another really unique instalment of the franchise. It isn't very similar to the original movie or the manga, it takes on a life of its own, which is what I like about it. Understandably, it's not as accessible as the movie or the manga. The dialogue is extremely heavy, and the themes are almost a challenge to decipher. Oshii definitely turned off his filter for this. 
It plays out more similar to some of his earlier works like Angel's Egg, more than it does Ghost in the Shell. The technical level of the movie's animation alone deserves respect. It blends 2D and 3D animation in a way that is still some of the best I've ever seen. And Oshi's directing here is hands down some of his best and most creative. I love how he composed shots in this movie in a way that exposed opportunities for animation rather than to hide them. And the surreal world design of the movie's second half is just so memorable. The story has a distinct level of surrealism too. Themes and plot points are hidden under layers of quotes and large chunks of philosophical musings. Every aspect of the movie is a puzzle. Innocence is probably the furthest the franchise has wandered from its original roots, but I genuinely think the movie is so underappreciated. I'd advise any fans of the franchise to give it a few watches. But Innocence has gained its reputation in small groups of fans who adore it, but it didn't capture the wide scale audience of the original movie. But the same can't be said about the next adaptation, that has arguably matched Oshi's movie in popularity. Standalone Complex is a TV series around 50 episodes. This project was helmed by Kenji Kamiyama, who had spent his career up until this point shadowing Mamoru Oshii. Kamiyama notes that the style used for Standalone Complex was a mixture of Oshii and Shiro. His years working under Oshii have shaped his style to be very similar, but he mentions that the humorous aspects of the manga would have more of a presence in Standalone Complex. It's clear instantly that the series is very different from the movie. I'd say this adaptation is the closest to the original manga, and definitely a lot more suitable for fans that were put off by Oshii's surreal style. Matoko's character design, for example, returns to brighter hair and a more extravagant set of outfits, and her tone as a character is reflected in this too. Due to the length of the series, Kamiyama would have to expand his scope into aspects that Oshii just didn't have time to. Long-term world politics, for instance. The political climate of the world would have to be a lot more considerate, and previous episodes would have to have an effect on future storylines. And this is done fantastically, more so than any other installation. Kamiyama really adds depth to the world's progression, bringing the city to life. He mentions that his style of storytelling and story structure have been influenced heavily by his work with Oshi. This is apparent in the show's episodic stories that become kind of mini movies within themselves. I think what's interesting about Standalone Complex is how it also takes time to divert from the main story, and maybe have an episode or two focusing on a single character or situation. Togus' solo episode is a brilliant example of this. We get a level of specific character development that just hasn't existed in the franchise before. We get to explore new aspects of the Ghost in the Shell world. This is such a unique element to bring to the franchise, adding so much depth to the experience. Just have to give Kamiyama huge props for it. I think what made Standalone Complex a good adaptation was how diverse it was. Regardless of if you liked Ghost in the Shell for Shiro's manga or Oshi's film, there was a bit of everything in here all glazed over with Kamiyama's unique touch. And you can kind of see that as a formula for adaptations here, both maintaining the core aspects of a series that made it so unique originally, but also adding in your own distinct style. Arise is a perfect example of how this formula isn't so easy to pull off. And Arise was a weird project, it kind of exists as a bunch of different versions. There's a manga, and an OVA series, and recently a short TV series. Most of these being just average at best. The absolute best episodes pass as half-decent sci-fi stories, but pale in comparison to the franchise's previous installments. I think what Arise doesn't do well as an adaptation is create an identity. All of the aforementioned elements are in Arise, but it doesn't embrace them enough. The stories don't have enough depth, the world lacks in comparison to standalone complex, and it tackles very few of the philosophical elements of the franchise. And most importantly, it certainly doesn't inject its own original qualities. It's almost as if they stripped Ghost in the Shell down to its very basics and didn't really add anything. I think Arise just lacks a strong stylistic vision. The production just varied too much throughout the series, you never felt like you were watching someone's work. And that's the same for the upcoming live action adaptation. This is quite interesting since there's a new adaptation coming up very soon, but it's the same as Arise, it doesn't have an established figurehead behind it. Director Rupert Sanders hasn't directed a lot at all to be honest. He has a background in advertising, and personally I don't see much of an artistic identity in his work. Obviously it's not out yet and it'll be interesting to see if this leads to the movie's possible downfall, but it's certainly a theme that has ran throughout the franchise. When I think about Ghost in the Shell, I think about bold artistic choices from every department of production. Shiro, Oshi, Kamiyama, and so many other positions I didn't get to talk about in this video all grabbed this franchise by the horns and steered it in their own direction. I think that's a really valuable lesson to learn, not just for adapting Ghost in the Shell, but for adapting anything in general. 
But Ghost in the Shell is something I really love. It's absolutely one of my favourite franchises. And I've made a lot of other videos discussing all of these adaptations in more detail, so be sure to click one of them on the screen. But that's it for this video, so thank you very much for watching.